We are at the Challenge Youth Conference in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, and we welcome you to another episode of Ministry Matters That Matter. Today I have as a special guest my good friend David Shannon. All right, so let's talk about, and first of all, you go any direction you want, but ministry in general in the church. You've worked with churches all sizes. You've worked with elderships. I think you've worked in churches that didn't have elderships, maybe. But in ministry in general, what's, do you have any advice for us as far as building a congregation, working with elders? And, and feel free to share anything about what you do on evangelism. I know I'm talking okay. about that you, but. Okay, uh, you know, there's, as you know, that's a broad question. Um, congregations, uh, they, need, they need someone that's going to help lead their um, calendar. Yes. And, and also their big days. Mm -hmm. And I think every minister has to get into a congregation and figure out, is there anything about the, the calendar activities or the big days that need help? You know, if you go into a congregation and they're just, they have family days that are top shelf. Well, you don't need to mess that up. Yeah. You come yeah. in and be supportive of that. But if you realize, you know, we have a family day and not really much is said about it. And our attendance only goes up 3% on yeah. family day. Well, maybe that's a good time, you know, a, like a year in advance, not last moment. But when you're planning the calendar, you know, look at some of those. And, and my goal used to be, let's do something in a significant, like when I say significant, I mean the whole congregation uh -huh. is what I mean by, you know, there, you know, there's always certain ministries that are going to yes. have things going all the time. Yes. But when you think the, the preacher has the blessing in the position that he's in to think, whole congregation. Holistically, yeah. You know, your deacons, they have certain ministries, whatever. But but you're thinking holistically here. And so what could you do once a quarter? You know, and so we used to intentionally separate family day and friend day instead of not have a family friend day, but because that gave us an event in two separate, events, two separate yeah. quarters. And then like vacation Bible school, could be another event in a quarter. You know, a gospel meeting could be another event or maybe having a, a, a special um, like seminar mm -hmm. that, that would run maybe on Saturday, but then continue on a Sunday. So it, you know, the whole congregation in, in a sense is involved in it. Uh, but what's important about those, and this may sound, you know, minor to the listener, but what's important about those is it gives all the congregation, something to invite people to that I would say for the, for the average member, it's an easy invite. Because what we're doing is we're leading up to building a culture where people invite all the time. Yes. And, and here's the thing, you know, a preacher can go into a congregation and say, well, I'm just going to tell everybody to invite somebody once a week. Well, if you haven't built that culture, most people are not going to invite somebody once a week. But if, if you're willing to look at this at like a three to five year journey and say, how can we grow a culture where everybody here is inviting? You know, I used to borrow a phrase from uh, Jerry Jenkins. Mm -hmm. He would say, if from the pulpit to the back pew, everybody's inviting, the church will grow. Yes. And, and so when you have those once a quarter events and as a preacher, three weeks out, you're prepping the congregation. Hey, have you, have you already made a list of five people you're going to invite? Have you been praying for those five? Let's pray every day this week for the five you're going to invite. And by next week, we need to give the invitation. Okay. And, and so the hope is that, that seeds are planted. And, you know, and then I like to talk with the congregation about every seed that's planted through an invitation is important because just because they don't come to this event, whenever I think about a timeline of life, there are windows in people's life where something happens and they usually will start thinking about faith or God mm -hmm. or religion in a way they haven't before. Mm -hmm. And so when that window comes, what you want them to say is, my friend at work has been inviting me once a year to family mm -hmm. day. He's invited me like the last six family days. And now I'm ready. Now I'm ready. I'm going to ask him at, war, at, at work, I want to ask him what time church starts. Yeah. That's cool. and, and so, you know, there, there has to be that culture. So bringing this conversation back around to once a quarter, but when people grow comfortable with that, then you start talking to them about, hey, when somebody moves on your street, go down and meet them, but also invite them to church. And, and 
when you have that good conversation at the grocery store as you're checking out, go ahead and invite that person to church. And, and so you build that culture where people over time just become much more comfortable inviting. Then you have to have some within the congregation that are willing to go up to those individuals and make them feel welcome. Yeah. Ask them to sit with you in a Bible class, sit with you in worship, take them out to eat at lunch. But then you also have to have those that are willing to go up to them and say, hey, I've noticed you visited four or five weeks. Would you like to just sit down and study the Bible? Do you have any questions? Mm -hmm. and, and so it's gone from everybody inviting, everybody making them feel welcome, but then someone setting it's down. Noticers that are keeping track of how yes. often it's showing up. Yes, and, and it's, it's really closing that loop mm -hmm. on evangelism. Yes. Um, and so a lot of those things, I think at congregations that are doing it well, uh, you're seeing years of development mm -hmm. of the individuals. Mm -hmm. It may be a program sometime, but even more important than the programs, the programs are only tools mm -hmm. to help people in the congregation carry out the work that God expects us to do. I remember asking Jerry Jenkins once, since you mentioned him one time, mm -hmm. he did a workshop for us at Graymere. And so I, actually somebody in the audience, one of our deacons, I think, asked him, said, you know, tell me, what's your program? And he said, it's not so much a program as we, it's an expectation. We talk about it all the time. We have a group doing studies all the time and everybody else understands their job is to invite people and to help this group get studies. Yep. And so they had to work over time, you know, they went, what, 40 years with 50 baptisms a year? Yeah. It's a culture thing is what I'm hearing from you. Yes, Okay. absolutely. Us thinking souls, and it has to be, it has to be uh, genuine. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not just a program. Mm -hmm. It's, hey, we really love you. We really care about you. We'd really love for you to come and visit here. When you're here, our love for you is going to be proven by the way we welcome mm -hmm. you. You know, and even when we sit down and study, it's speaking the truth in love. Mm -hmm. and, and so when we can do all of that out of just a genuine love for the Lord mm -hmm. and for them, uh, commitment to the faith, it, it creates a beautiful culture. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. All right. So you've led in several arenas. I know that long before you even came to Freed Hardeman, you'd of course, been a leader, but also been doing workshops on leadership, et cetera. And then now you've stepped into a different world where you're you're leading in a different arena. And I can remember you and I having those conversations right before you started at Freed. And so what are some leadership tips as you kind of draw on all of that experience over the years? You know, I like to, I mentioned to you before, when we're talking about evangelism, a timeline of life. Mm -hmm. when, when I'm doing like pastoral counseling or talking about evangelism or talking about leadership, I'll often get out just a blank sheet of paper and I'll put a timeline. And when I'm talking to this person, I'll say, you were born here. And if you live an average life, let's just say you lived 80. And then we talk about mm -hmm. in between. That line of thinking has helped me a lot. Also, when we think about the movement of time and people as it relates to defining leadership. And, you know, there are some awesome definitions of leadership. And so uh, I don't, you know, if, if someone said, what's your definition? I'd probably say this, but it's more probably a description. Mm -hmm. You know, it, the, there's better definitions. But I love the simple description of leaders move people. Mm -hmm. and, and it's kind of that timeline. You know, if, if you want to talk about that person that was just baptized last week, well, over the next year, you think about that timeline, over the next year, how could you help them grow and develop? Well, you could be a leader in that, but they're gonna need resources. Maybe they need your time. Maybe they need somebody else's time in the congregation. They're gonna need knowledge. They're gonna need experiences. There may be even other resources they need. And the, the reason people need leaders is leaders help provide resources. Mm -hmm. and, and so when we think about leadership, we think about moving people from A, where they are, to B, where they could be. But then we think about we do it by providing the resources they need. Now, granted, they often, they can't see exactly that point mm -hmm. B, but the power of leadership is vision. Mm -hmm. And so as a leader, you can see B better than they can see B. Mm -hmm. And so you start helping them see B. Mm -hmm. You start helping them grasp and hopefully hold on to that vision. And, but then you start putting the things in their life. And so you can have that mindset if you're looking at an individual, 
You can have that very same mindset if you're leading a ministry. You know, I've sat down with, with new deacons before that say, you know, I don't really know how to lead this, this ministry. And I'd oftentimes say to a new deacon, I would say, look, if you want me to, I'd like to walk with you for like a year and, and I'll just give you some guidance of things you can do, et cetera. And, and in that, what I would do is that very same concept. I'd help them see where, where can your ministry be in a year? Or if somebody becomes involved in your ministry, where can they be in a year? And what are the things that's needed to get there? And, and so then it, it helps us break down mm-hmm. leadership in ways that, that um, you know, as a leader, we can digest them, but, but then we can better envision of, okay, and then we have something to sell. We have something, uh, and I mean, sell in the best of ways. Um, you know, it, it's kind of like uh, that, that leadership concept of buy-in. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if we don't get people to buy in, because what we never want them to do is to think they're carrying out the leader's mm-hmm. ministry. No, this is your ministry. You you own it. You lead it. You go forward in it. Mm-hmm. And so uh, helping people see that it's a movement. Yes. And, um, you know, if, if people aren't growing, you know, it's kind of that thing. You're not a leader. You're out for a walk by yourself. Yeah. You know, but if people are growing, they're okay. You're you're leading them into that growth. That's good. Well, I quote uh, in a book, your leaders are people movers. So that's one of my favorite leadership yeah. quotes. Another of your quotes, if your ears are ever burning that I use, I've used at Heritage is if you haven't said it five times, you haven't yeah. said it. Yeah. So I think that's roughly how you say yeah. it. Yeah. So, so and, the, Elaborate on that, and also, do you have as we're getting ready to wrap up? What give us a line? Give us something that we can all be quoting. Okay. No pressure whatsoever. Okay, I'll give you one that that's related to what you just said. Uh, you know, we haven't told them five times. We haven't told them, and and that's um, you know, I, I'll use that more often in the lighter sense of communication. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, leaders get frustrated because they're like, I had this event, and and people didn't show up. When I asked them about it, they said, Well, I didn't know it was this weekend. And they're like, how could they know it's not this weekend? I, I said in an announcement on Sunday, last Sunday, it was this weekend. And so that's when I would just nicely say to them, I'd say, did you tell them five times? Yes. And, in and five different ways. Five different ways. Yes. And, you, you know, so, you know, so you start looking at the creative ways. And again, if you want to get on people's schedule, you need to do it for three weeks. You know, three weeks out, have you started telling them? And during that, are you using five different modes? Um, communication. The, the other thing that, that uh, I, I, I say it to younger ministers that I work with, yes. and they will come back to me later and say, I get what you're meaning by, by that now. Because it sounds so fundamental and elementary, it's almost insulting. But I'll say to them, communication's not as easy as you think. Yes. And what I mean by that is if you're not working hard at clear communication, mm-hmm. you're not communicating yes. clearly. You think it's easy, but it's not. And so you go through a few of those failures yes. where... You think I've said this and nobody's heard it. Yeah, it didn't well, then, come across the same. Yeah. Th- then you realize communication isn't as easy as you think. Well, I think we both say that one of the biggest challenges in working at university is the communication. Yes. Because you've got several folks and everybody communicates differently. Uh-huh. So what? that's why the whole five modes is really important because yes. what connects to this one doesn't connect to that. And yes. This, you know, so. Okay, so here's, here, here will be my, my wrap up about communication that goes even deeper, though. It goes down to our faith. And, and when you think about a, a minister that is often before the congregation or before a class or whatever it, it may be, think how important this is. I believe that what we stop talking about, we stop believing. And what we stop believing, we stop living. Amen. And. And so it is so important for us. You know, we talked earlier about preaching. Mm -hmm. It can be true about teaching a class too. When we think about what are we going to cover in a year's time and we're planning some series, we need to make sure that every year there's some fundamental Mm -hmm. series in there and and don't apologize for it. You know, it, it breaks my heart to hear a guy do a fundamental lesson and spend the first five minutes apologizing to everybody that these are fundamentals. You know, we... They're important. 
They're so important. And uh, yeah, maybe there's a different type of introduction we do to those uh, to, to help people see why we're doing it, but don't apologize for it because if, if you don't do those fundamental lessons, let a few years go by, and especially let a generation go by, and nobody's going to be believing. What is it practice. now? About 29% well, of the overall population, and depending on the study, between 35 and 40 of those under between the age of 18 and 30 are religious nuns in the sense that they have no religion at all. So yeah. what we're finding is fewer and fewer people know basics of Scripture. And mm -hmm. I think... One of the biggest dangers in preaching is we say, well, you know the story. Well, the reality is a lot of us don't know the story. Yes. And actually, if I say that, then I've offended somebody because they're like, well, then I don't need to be here. I obviously I, don't know something everybody else knows. Exactly. Good. Exactly. Yeah. The, the in-house jargon really is offensive to a lot of our younger Christians mm -hmm. and guests. Yeah. And, and we need the best we can. You know, we are... In, in preaching, in a sense, uh, you know, we are public speakers, yeah. and and we do not need to speak so that only the core group mm -hmm. insider language. Yeah, it's it's it, it just is offensive. Mm -hmm. Thank you for taking time to hang out with me today. Thank and, you for uh, the invitation. I appreciate all you do. Love and respect. You're still my favorite preacher. <laughs> You're and, right. uh, appreciate you, Kurt. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Ministry Matters That Matter. And I hope you realize that the ministry you're doing for God does matter. It's making a difference. Stay strong. Keep taking a stand for God and know that you're making a difference. You have a blessed day.